Today we're going to talk about a topic and how it can be handled, and it's a very serious topic. I've mentioned in a few other previous videos that what I did not understand in my 20s was the magnitude of seriousness and responsibility there is when you get married to someone. I really did not comprehend that in my 20s starting out in life, but it became abundantly clear by the time I hit my 30s and 40s that getting married is no light thing. I know some people treat it that way. They get married, they get divorced, they don't think too much of it, but really, maybe that's even part of the problem because when you marry someone, you have just doubled, and if they have kids, maybe quadrupled, the amount of responsibility you have for their future, their security, their medical insurance, the mentoring time that you'll provide. When you get married, you're pretty much walking away from the carefree lifestyle you can enjoy as a single person. I'll begin by sharing with you what happened with an expat that I knew personally here in the Philippines. Again, I'll leave his name out of it for his own privacy, but some of you may know who I'm speaking of. Now, he was an American guy, a good guy. Everybody liked him. And like many, he came to the Philippines, met a good Filipino woman. She had a couple kids. They got married and he started a business here in the Philippines. And through that business, a lot of us expats got to know him. And again, a really good guy to just hang out, talk with, and very conscientious about how well he ran his business. Now he was already up in age, I would guess somewhere near 70, if not late 60s, maybe a little over 70. I never knew exactly how old he was, but full of energy and seemingly in pretty good health. So business was good, everything was great, Together, they had a baby, and normally you would want to register the birth of that baby to the American embassy so that that child has their U.S. citizenship established, and being as how he was on Social Security, there would be an increase to his Social Security because now he has another dependent that is a U.S. citizen. Well, things began to go badly when he neglected to report the birth overseas. And even though it would have benefited him and his wife immediately, he was busy running his business and just didn't get around to it. And then sadly, to the surprise of all, he passed away. It was a shock to all of us. So now, after having been married for several years to this Filipina woman, she is now widowed with three children. Because she never lived for the required amount of residency time in the USA, she had no rights or benefits from his social security to continue after his death. So no more money from the social security and no money for the child because his birth was never registered as being abroad. So no money from there. That left only the business, which he had never shown her how to run this business. It was in her name, but she didn't know how to run it, and he never taught her. So overwhelmed between his passing away and not knowing how to run the business, she put it up for sale. Another expat bought the business, and she now had a lump sum to get her by. But again, a chunk of that went towards his funeral expenses and such. And so in the end, I do believe that some expats that were going to try and figure out how to register that child for her in the hopes that they could at least get her his continuing social security benefits until the child was either 18 or I believe it's up to 22 if they're enrolled full-time in college. But I, I had already moved from that city by the, before any of that ever happened, so I don't know that it ever actually got taken care of. But the point is, she sold the business, had a lump sum, and as you know, that amount eventually gets spent month after month, year after year, and this was about six years ago. And so now she found herself 
back to zero, back where she was before she met him. Only now she has one more child, no income, no pension continuing. She has to start over. And so that's why I just kind of call it back to zero. So the point here is that when you get married, there is a responsibility upon us men as the provider to make some sort of arrangements for when we're gone so that this sort of thing does not happen to the Filipino wife that we love. They love their wife and most importantly, they truly do trust her. Because when I have talked about this topic with various expats, a lot of them pucker up and say, well, she's going to take advantage of me. If I share access to my money with my wife, she's going to rip me off. And my response is, why did you marry somebody you don't trust? So for this discussion, we're going to work on this premise. You're married to a Filipina woman that you love and you trust her. Now I'll give you how I am handling all of this, but it's not the only way to handle it. Some guys choose to get a life insurance policy. Me personally, I'm not into that. As it's often been said, you don't want to be worth more dead than alive. Another problem with life insurance is when the time comes, you have to really ask yourself, is your wife competent enough to remember, oh, here's where the phone number is for that life insurance company. Here's where the paperwork is. Contact the office at that number. Talk to somebody. Is her English good enough that she can convey and have conversation with an insurance agent in order to make the beneficiary payments begin to happen. It's going to have to be transferred to a bank that she has in the Philippines. Is she savvy enough to make that happen? Now, depending on who you're married to, if you really want to be honest about it, some Filipinas, they can handle that no problem at all. As long as they know where that paperwork is in an envelope in the drawer, when the day comes, they can handle it. They can make it happen. They can give, they know what a routing number, an account number is. They know how to use an ATM card. They can make it happen. But if we're really honest, a lot of Filipinas would be like a deer in the headlights and they're not going to know how to make that whole life insurance policy actually result in a deposit to her bank. Which means maybe she asks for the help of someone else and there's the possibility she gets ripped off. So myself, I'm not a real big fan of life insurance as a way to ensure your wife is taken care of after you're gone. Again, that's a personal decision. You may want to do that. That's great. Me, myself, I don't see it as an option I'm going to take. Now, what my wife and I have talked about at length many times is what we call the plan. The plan has a couple different stages to it and a couple different elements, and she's very familiar with the plan for the day that I'm not here anymore. This involves bringing her up to speed, number one, on how to manage money, how to have a bank account, how to check the balance, how to use the debit card. A lot of Filipinas have never had any experience with that. So getting her familiar with that was like stage one. And she's got that pretty much nailed down. Now the next step is a progression and a layered process of steadily making deposits into that bank account so that as each year goes by, she has a growing and growing balance for when I'm gone. Now you might be asking, why not just dump all that money in there right now? Well, because that money is currently in investments and those investments over time can grow. So having it just sit in a fiat state in cash in a bank, you're actually losing money. You put money into a bank, doesn't matter how much it is, over the next 10 years, even if the bank is giving you 3%, which most banks don't even give 3%, inflation is higher than that. It varies year to year. 
but guaranteed the inflation rate is higher which means that your value on your dollar is going to deflate over time think of it like an ice cube out in the hot sun every hour that goes by it gets smaller and smaller it may still be the same 10 20 30 50 thousand dollars but it doesn't have the buying power it had 10 years ago so i do not recommend moving a large amount all at once unless you're over 70 years old because once you're after 70 years old let's just face it anything could happen you could go to sleep and just not wake up it's a possibility but when you're younger say in your 50s or 60s what you do is every month or every quarter you make another deposit meanwhile the majority of your money is working for you in whatever investment vehicle you feel comfortable with it could be traditional stocks stocks with dividends it could be crypto it could be gold silver it could be buying a piece of land and land banking it in your home country whatever investment vehicle you feel will be profitable you keep your money earning money as long as you can before cashing any of it out to move into what is basically going to be her retirement fund now the two places i suggest to put this money are her personal bank account as well as her Philippines Social Security a lot of guys don't know that yes the Philippines does have a Social Security retirement system however unlike the American version which does not allow you to access that money until you're at least 62 in the Philippines if you file that you have an emergency and you've been paying into Social Security and you have a balance you can draw on that balance for an emergency Emergency. So a lot of Filipinos end up emptying out their Social Security balance before they actually retire. However, again, if you are educating your Filipino wife on money management, you sit down with her every quarter or whenever you decide every month and you say, OK, here's how much we're going to put into your personal bank account and here's how much we're going to put into your Social Security account. As more time goes by, that balance begins to increase now for extra credit rather than her just having that fiat cash sitting in the bank for extra credit you could try to teach her how to invest it probably through the bank it would be the safest way to do this so that she can go into the branch and say well that money i put into san miguel brewing company or ayala land investments but she could walk into the bank and say you know that money that i've been putting into this investment for the last 10 years i want to move some of that to my personal bank my husband passed away and i need liquid cash now that's another extra credit thing you can do so that the money isn't just sitting there slowly getting eroded by devaluation the other thing you can do which again is part of our plan is to find a place we're both happy with and buy a home the land will of course be in her name and the home I don't care if I own another home in my whole life the only reason I would be buying a home partly because we'll both enjoy it while we live there but the chief reason of buying a home for me is as another layer of security for her she will never have to have a house payment she'll never have to rent the rest of her life and wonder where that money's coming from she will own this home she will own the land she will have a place to live the rest of her life now this is something that i recommend you do after at least and again this is just my recommendation buy a home for you and your wife after two or three years of good marriage do not get married and go buy a house two months later you find a whole lot about a person when you're married and living with them and you may figure out two years later there's no way I see a future with this woman I'm so glad I didn't buy her a house so wait and if two three years after marriage you've got a good marriage she is a trustworthy loving person well now go ahead and make that commitment to go buy a house for her security because once you buy it 
You're never going to see that money again. It is her home permanently, forever, until she sells it. But you're not getting anything out of it. After two or three years of good marriage before you start thinking to buy a home, but buying a home is an added layer of security for your wife after you're gone. Now, as I said, this is how I and my wife are handling our future plan. I don't expect her to know how to manage all the various passwords and protocols for the crypto portfolios. I don't expect her to learn all that, which is why over time I will slowly divest and move it into her name. When I pass away, there's no need for probate, there's no need for contacting a third party, the money will already be there where she can access it. But again, this is not the only way, it's simply what I consider to be the most efficient way. So if you have other ideas, other variations, feel free to share that in the comments and together we can maybe all learn something and handle this very big responsibility so that our wife does not end up back at zero when we're gone.